Tell me how your deal to acquire Aerojet came together. Yeah, well, first of all, Morgan, I think this uh, ties in perfectly with the strategy I laid out four years ago. Starting with the merger of L3 and Harris, we wanted to build a company to provide more competition for the Department of Defense. So the fact that we're growing organically and or inorganically is not a big surprise. You know, this is going to benefit the customers, it's going to benefit the shareholders, and it's going to benefit the employees. The customers want to strengthen competition, and they want to bolster the defense industrial base, and this acquisition does it. Aerojet Rocketdyne being part of L3 Harris, we have the scale and the strength to invest in people, processes, R&D, and we all know competition spurs innovation. Customer loves innovation, I love innovation, and the employees love innovation. From a shareholder perspective, this fills in a gap in our portfolio, which are the weapon systems. And I think when you look at the budget, you look at the national defense strategy, this is an absolute growth market. We're going to add $7 billion of uh, backlog, 3x their annual revenue. It's accretive on EPS, accretive on cash, and uh, makes a lot of sense financially. And then the employees can't wait to welcome the 5,000 employees to uh, L3 Harris. We're a technology company. They're a technology company. We're focused on national security for the U.S. and our allies and uh, 50,000 strong after the merger closes. It's going to be exciting. I, I want to get more into what this means in terms of a future L3 Harris portfolio and what Aerojet brings to the table, especially because space has been such a big outsized growth area, including when it comes to defense spending. But first, what makes you feel confident that you can get this deal done in front of the FTC when Lockheed couldn't? Yeah, well, that was two years ago. Different time, different company. I think the uh, government is going to look at four things. Number one, they're going to look at does this strengthen competition, and it absolutely does. Secondly, they're going to say does this bolster the uh, defense industrial base? This company will have the strength and the power of L3 Harris behind it. It does. They're going to look at us and see that these are two new markets we're getting into, weapon systems, space propulsion, no overlap, no vertical integration. And then they're going to look at the uh, concept of merchant supplier. You know, L3 was formed 25 years ago as a merchant supplier. It's an interesting term. It basically means, will you sell your products to whoever you need to? Aerojet has that business model. We're going to maintain it. We absolutely want to sell these to the primes, to the OEMs, to the end user. So when you look at those four criteria, I think it makes sense. There'll be a thorough review. We'll respond. They'll respond. I respect the process, and uh, we'll see how it plays out in 23. The merchant supplier piece of this is certainly key, and I think about uh, CEOs at other defense primes who are very vocal uh, about the last potential tie-up with Aerojet, Greg Hayes at Raytheon coming to mind, who had said that Aerojet needs, quote, adult supervision just recently, given the fact that the company is going through a lot and has come through a lot. How do you apply adult supervision uh, to that supply chain, which has been which has been an issue for a Raytheon and many others? Yeah, and as you can imagine, I've, I reached out to uh, Raytheon, ULA, Lockheed, and all of our customers last night. So we've already been in, in contact, and they understand uh, our strategy and what we what we want to do. Uh, I think the entire industrial base is struggling with supply chain challenges. It's pretty well documented. And I think we have the processes and the controls and, and, and the people that are going to be able to help improve the performance of this company. I go back to the L3 and the Harris merger. You know, we took out over $600 million of cost. We have common systems. We have common processes. We understand the industry. We understand operations. We understand program management. And I'm excited to get this deal behind us. So talk to me a little bit more about portfolio mix and what that's going to mean in terms of future earnings. I ask that because a big portion of the L3 Harris portfolio is quote-unquote short-cycle business. According to Jefferies, it's about 40 percent. Aerojet, Rocketdyne, 100 percent long-cycle business, which means that some of those big re revenue opportunities on the horizon uh, for Aerojet are, are going to be coming down the pipe in a couple of years, things like nuclear deterrence, missile defense of the homeland, ULA, which you mentioned, the new Vulcan rocket, which has a huge launch deal uh, with Amazon's Project Kuiper satellite constellation, NASA's Artemis, hypersonics, which eventually will become more meaningful within the defense budget. Um, I guess I sort of just laid it out, but, uh, but how do you balance uh, how do you balance that portfolio versus the amount of debt you're taking on both between this and the Viasat acquisition? Yeah, no, great, great question. So when I look at our portfolio, 
L3 Harris historically is known for situational awareness from space and, and airplanes, our resilient comms with our radios and our networks, and then uh, the sensors. We have sensors in space, air, maritime, and, and ground. So the missing piece, you know, was the weapons. And then a couple months ago, we announced FIASAT, which I know how we feel about acronyms, JADC2, <laughs> connecting all that. So I feel real comfortable that when these two deals are behind us, we have the portfolio in all the right domains, all the right areas. I wouldn't anticipate doing anything for several years. And in fact, we have some non-core assets that I'll probably sell in 23, when the financing market turns around, pay down the debt. So that's how I kind of see the next couple of years playing out.